it's hard to pinpoint how you began doing something in, to one specific moment, but there was a specific moment when I discovered that I wanted to go look at birds, and that was really at lunch 15 years ago when someone said, apropos of nothing at the lunch table, oh, the warblers will be coming through Central Park soon. The realization that hundreds of wild animals, effectively, uh, were going to be passing through the middle of a great city where I'd lived for a great deal of my life, and I'd never known it. It was as if someone said, I've got magic glasses to give you, and you're going to put them on, and you're going to see an entire vast world that had been hidden from you before and that you'd never noticed. I had clearly been straining towards some encounter with the natural world um, and just doing it without almost knowing I was doing it and, and, and hoping to find some some connection to the to wilderness. Birds are a very small thing to put the burden of wilderness on them, but they really do come from what's left of wilderness. And so uh, it was really encountering some wildness that I was craving that made me feel whole again. Here were these creatures coming from elsewhere, coming from the rainforest, coming from forests far away from me, uh, and passing through my world and bringing with them an aspect of that world that they came from, which was once the world that covered this country. Uh, which was once full of old growth forest, large stands of trees. And so they are a kind of reminder of a world we once inhabited. Uh, not only that, they're a reminder of the world that literally, physically produced us. We are of the woods ourselves, even in the same way that long before that we are of the ocean, we are of the water. And so they bring us things that are both simultaneously outside of the conventional daily world we're used to, and that are also reminders of deep elements of our own makeup of our own structure. Bird watching, it's seemingly the most bookish of activities. You bring a book literally with you. You bring a guidebook to help you identify these birds and name them. And when you see them, you're giving them names. You are participating in this world of 18th century um, classification. At the same time that you're gathering the birds into your world, they are luring you deeper and deeper into their world, into the woods, into the swamps, into uh, the wild places where they are that they are native to. And so you are never wholly resolving the bird into its scientific, understood, defined self, but you are also experiencing it as this wild, elusive creature. And for me, a lot of bird watching has to do with seeing the bird both ways. You're seeing a Baltimore Oriole, and you're seeing an orange and black bird that lives beyond our ability to ever wholly know or name it. I think the double vision of birding has a larger application to living in a world in which one balances science with a sense of the transcendent or a sense of wonder. It's the mystery that they should be there at all after their migratory journey, after their evolutionary journey, and then simultaneously it's the strangeness that you should be there at all too. And so I think anything that makes you suddenly aware of the sheer mysterious fact of your existence has about it an aura of the transcendent. In my book I write about the two discoverers of the theory of evolution, because I think it's really useful to look at them side by side. Uh, one is Alfred Russell Wallace, the other is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin has become the much more famous figure. Uh, Wallace was kind of written out of the equation. Darwin, when he started, was himself religious. That was a religious impulse to go out and bring back all you could find of the created world. That was the impulse that led him out when he was a young man. Um, more and more he realized he was filling in the pieces of a puzzle whose very outlines had changed radically. One can read The Origin of the Species and see it as pure materialism, that uh, the natural world is explainable, everything has a cause, and everything is understood, and therefore mystery has been eliminated. For Wallace, uh, the theory of evolution ultimately became the beginning of the mystery, not the end of the mystery. Although he wanted to solve it, to solve what he called the mystery of mysteries, he found in the end that it was not a sufficient answer. He felt that human beings were too mysterious and the biodiversity was too grand to be explained without some higher power. He is much too Darwinian for the intelligent design advocates, but he is much too theistic for the ultra-Darwinians. He really lives in the middle. We live more and more in a divided world, and it began to take shape after Darwin, in a sense, after the 19th century, when science was science and religion was religion. I think that that's part of the debased nature of the debate now, where people have the mistaken notion that to um, 
accept the theory of evolution is to part with your religious views, whereas 40% of American scientists believe in God. Francis Collins, who spearheaded the Human Genome Project, refers to DNA as the language of God. That doesn't mean we need to pretend that scientific theories are in fact religious or import religious theories into scientific theories where they don't belong. But one can speak in, even if things have separated into multiple realms or two main realms, those realms can still, can still talk to each other. One of the reasons I love bird watching is that in a way for me it makes everybody a 19th century naturalist again. It brings everybody back to that older world where scientific inquiry and religious inquiry were overlapping fields. They were almost the same. And it creates a, a space that is a reminder of a time that we really can't inhabit anymore, but that is, I think, a wholesome place to be because it is a reminder that the one world actually doesn't negate the other world. It is absolutely possible, as it was for Wallace, not only to be a strict adherent of the theory of evolution, but to actually be the originator of the theory of evolution and yet still believe God is present in the world somehow. There's a wonderful Robert Frost poem called The Oven Bird, one of the wonderful little warblers I can see in Central Park. And the conclusion of that poem is the bird essentially saying, the question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. And that is the question that haunts me. I think it's a question that haunts everyone in the modern world. What to make of a diminished thing? Is God the diminished thing after Darwin? Are we the diminished thing after Darwin? Bird watching is not necessarily the answer to that question, but it helps me frame a response. This bird watching is what I try to make of this diminished uh, thing, where we don't have a lot of wilderness left, and where we have large questions about what remains to us of our religious, of our religious beliefs, and even of our understanding of what it means to be a human being.